Hey, what's going on, everybody? Jason here. Welcome to another special guest episode on the Authentic Persuasion Show. Super excited for my guest today, Phil Gerbashak, is going to be joining me here. Uh, he knows sales. There's the work that he does officially. There's all the stuff that he does on the side. We were just chatting about all the different things he has going on. Uh, he's a sales speaker, an executive, and a sales expert, truly. Very few people uh, I would put in the category of sales expert, uh, but he is a sales leader, a mentor, podcaster, coach. He's written six books, over 3,000 articles he's written, which makes me feel like I'm way behind because uh, I am definitely nowhere close to that. Um, he works with businesses to help them with their sales practice, everything else. Uh, he's also a truly amazing guy because he had me on his podcast, which means uh, he's, he's a good guy to know. And uh, I know we're going to have a blast talking about sales, leadership, everything to do with that. So stay tuned. Phil, welcome to my show this time. Welcome to, to my house. Woo good to be here. I, I like what you're done with the place. It's really nice. Ah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I put a lot of effort into it. You know, after coming to your house, I spruced up a little bit, figured out uh, you know what I could do. Since you're you're the pro, you've been at it for a long time. Yeah. Um, how long? Let's let's talk about this, right? Because yeah. I don't always do this and start here. People know my origin story and, and or you know how I came about this. You know, if they're tuning into the show, if they've been a part of this. How long have you been in sales? What what does what does early fill in sales look like and when? Like Yeah, good so good question. Yeah, so let's let's rewind a little just a smidge before sales because I think it's important, right? So I delivered email by hand for the National Security Agency in the Navy. So the NSA that listens. That was my job. And I thought the internet was fake though. So I went to college to be a school teacher and then I got bored and saw the internet was real. So I got a sales job. I got a sales job selling high-speed internet and doing tech support and all of that at an internet service provider back when high-speed internet wasn't fast, right? When it was 384, 768, could never handle even an image. I mean, the first email accounts were three megabytes. So one picture, people would send the, the ASCII Christmas tree and crush your email account. So that's how far back it goes, right? So with that, then I was a stockbroker. I went into IT, but training, I, I was the, the face of the IT department. I was the communication guy of the IT department. I was the guy that liaised between the business, all of our sellers in a, a brokerage house, right? That had brokers and advisors and research and investment banking and, uh, you know, folks that manage their uh, mutual funds and all of that. And then I would say like, really kind of, you know, the internet really popped. Like we went from one web 1.0 to web 2.0. And I would say that's really where my sales career took off because I started coaching our, our folks first on just how to be visible online, right? Because they weren't even on LinkedIn. They weren't allowed to have websites. They weren't barely allowed to have LinkedIn. I mean, I wrote the first social media policy was N.O. And our sales, and our sales team and their financial advisors, right? Financial planners, financial professionals were like, dude, do you actually, do you know like how to sell? And I'm like, yeah. Then why are you in IT? I'm like, well, I'm like a secret weapon because I know both ends, right? I had my brokerage license and a degree in computer science. And oh yeah, I got Web 2.0, like the whole conversation piece, social part of social media. And so blended that all together. And I started my own uh, business because my company wouldn't let me use the company name on LinkedIn and LinkedIn required a company name. So I started an LLC in about 2007, 2008. I gave my two year notice. And in 2010, I left uh, the first time corporate America to go off and do my own thing. Initially, thinking it was going to be leadership and management consulting. And then my first client fell flat. Thankfully, I could sell and teach people how to sell. So I went into that, selling my face off, teaching people how to sell. I was like, yeah, OK, yeah, this this is where I need to be. So that's where I stayed. I love it. So you didn't think of a sales career, but once you realized about the internet, you're like, let me let me go figure this thing out and then ended in, left, went back in. I think it's interesting when I hear that because I think of the people I've seen and, and I think you and I are similar in some aspects where the analytical side, bringing that to sales, right? Like what, what you're bringing versus the pure 
outgoing sales side without the technical behind it, right? Do you think that leverages well for what you've done where you have that analytical side, you know either how things work or you want to figure out how they work before you try to sell it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I've been fortunate that I've been in software sales a lot, but I've stayed, again, financial services, coached a lot of folks there, insurance, coached a lot of folks there. But for sure, to break it down into smaller parts, that analysis of that works. Although, you know, for anybody to call me analytical, Jason, would be surprising, right? Because people are my jam, but totally right. My thinking, right, strategically, that's absolutely how I think. It's just not how that's displayed in the rest of the world, right? Because frankly, um, that side often happens behind the scenes, right? That's back office, not front of house stuff. So for me, absolutely, totally helped me because I can break big ideas up into smaller chunks and then put them back together. And often there's a piece or two that are unnecessary. They might structurally have needed to be there before, but today they may not. So I think, yeah, that totally helps me all the time in that I can analyze, see what's important, only leverage that and then throw the rest of the stuff out. Where where do you think the balance is or what have you found with extrovert versus introvert and there's no pure there's very few few pure extroverts or introverts uh in a sales role and then also the analytical you know almost think of like the sales engineer person in a sales role what are your thoughts and experience yeah around that in the world? well i like first I'll, I'll just you know tell you i like dan pink's word of ambivert right that we flex yes. with people and i think that's that's really the key because for me Extroversion and introversion are where we get our energy from, not outgoing or shy, right? So outgoing and shy are not the same as extroversion and introversion. But I think if we listen, we win. If we're curious and we ask questions, we win. So I'll tell you, though I'm a capital E extrovert, no doubt, nobody would ever say otherwise. I love people and I'm very curious about them. So I don't have to talk to hear myself talk like a lot of extroverts that I've encountered do. In fact, I will tell you today, we had, I, I, was on a, I was on a team meeting call with uh, six or seven other alphas, I would say. They're certainly, uh, you know, very outgoing, very alpha, like I need to be heard. And I didn't say a word for 45 minutes. So I think it's important to have both. And then you throw in the analytical side, Again, that's part listening, but part processing, right? So, but the brain has to be functioning. It's not just listening and taking notes and then just asking that great question. It's also processing it and strate- strategy, strategically placing it where it belongs to fit so that then you can come at it and instead of saying a lot, you can say a little bit and that little bit is super impactful. So I think it's important to have both of those but then know what charges you up the most. And again, being an extrovert, I love to be in front of people or talking to somebody else who has energy like you so that I can then feed off of that because that gives me juice. And if I'm by myself, I'm probably asleep or maybe I'm reading a book, right? But a lot of times, even that, like I'll do that next to my wife. I just need her or my kid, right? I need them in the room. So yeah. Interesting, and and one of the things that came to my mind is there's the the outward appearance of something that looks extrovert. Uh, I completely agree about the ambivert term. I think that applies to most everybody. It's about situational energy and where you get it, and some things that uh, excite you, and some things that drain you, and what that looks like, and how your recovery is. Um, but that outward extroversion that I think sometimes is is it extroversion or is it confidence? that then leads to or comes across Mm. as this extroversion where this person seems like they just have this, you know, outgoing Uh. nature. But like you said, it's also you could be in a room with a bunch of other people who they need to be um, the center of attention. And because of your confidence, you don't because that's not actually what you need. Um, But in the right situations, it does fire you up. And then I'm thinking about in sales when somebody is looks on, like an extrovert on the outside, but coming from a place of confidence and skill and ability, they can be really effective in sales by talking the right amount, like you said, and then listening the right amount and not needing to be the hero all the time. 
Yeah, I, I think that's right. You know, Michael Port in Steal the Show is a, it explains this well. Preparation helps us be better performers. And I believe sales is a performance, right? A sales conversation is a performance. You should be prepared. And certainly introverted or extroverted doesn't matter, but you should prepare. And preparation gives us more confidence and more confidence makes us seem more outgoing or more extroverted. When in reality, it's really just confidence and maybe some of that's charisma, right? I mean, I need to have energy. I can't be a robot and talk to you like this, but right, I mean, we need we need some juice there. So I do think prep helps, right? Preparation, uh, you know, then confidence, absolutely in that. And then understanding to, your, to, to what we said there, you shouldn't need to fill the air with garbage. You should need to share what's important. And if you can listen, and really hear people saying less is often even more powerful. Yeah, completely. What's interesting about that part where you said where you need the charisma and sometimes people are robots. I meet people all the time that just come across that way, like very dry, very dull, like just very with withheld until you get them on a topic they're really excited about. And then all of a sudden you can see them change, no matter what it is. It could be cooking, it could be cars, it could be sports. And now all of a sudden they're a completely different person. So it's always fascinating because I feel like everyone has their thing. Um, where over here they might not be exciting and then over here they are. Um, let's shift a little bit when it comes to what you see, because you're dealing with a lot of people in a lot of organizations across various industries. What do you think salespeople are still missing the mark on as a group or overall in this era of sales and what consumers want? Well, I, I think they still think they can get by too much on charisma and product and not enough on actual business acumen and human relations. So if I think about that, your product most of the time is a commodity. Not all the time, right? But there's few really unique products. There might be a unique use case. Okay, that's true, but as soon as that's gone, then what? And charisma is great. You get people excited, but so what? About what, right? And and are they excited and then left empty or are they excited and left full? And if we focus on the human part of that first and then we'll go to the business side, if we focus on the human side, what's important to your job, to your industry, to your company, to you? What's important is the most important thing that we should talk about if I'm in sales and salespeople, I think, miss that. And then the other side, the whole business acumen, I don't think enough sales professionals are really professionals. I think they're sales amateurs. They don't read. Like, what's the last, you know, I can tell you, you ask them what the last book that they read was, I don't know. Okay, what's the last book you listen to? I don't know. Do you listen to any podcasts? Not really. What do you read? Well... Okay, so how do you stay sharp? Uh, okay, so when's the last class you took on your own? Uh, do you have any mentors, any heroes? No. How do you get better, dude? Or do that, right? How do you get better? How do you improve? And then, what do you know about the business? Are you reading the Wall Street Journal? Are you reading The Economist? Are you reading Business Insider? Are you reading the BBC? Or are you just looking at you know, CNN and Fox News and MSNBC and all these light news channels, right? I, that's not political, That's right. but that's entertainment. Stop looking for entertainment, start looking for information. Now, I'm not saying that information can't be presented in an entertaining way, it absolutely should be. Not what I'm saying, but just sound bites aren't enough. Like I remember 20 years ago, Jason, the Wall Street Journal, the front page was the What's News. And we were told, oh yeah, you know what? If you you can be smarter than 80, 90, 95% of people if you just read the What's News. Well, that's the Twitter headlines now. Everybody reads that with, uh, you know, uh, then it went to headline news. It just scrolled across the bottom. We had a, an eight minute news show. And now with 24 seven news, I mean, all those headlines are gone, but go deeper. What's the cause of those? What's the impact of those? How are those actually impacting business today? How's that impacting your customers? How's it impact your customers' customers? Have you done that sort of research? Are you an expert or are you an amateur? So I think that's really important. And then we connect that, right? Connecting to our customer 
because we care about them as people and business, I think that is the big missing piece because I don't know what it is. And, and, I don't, and I'm not saying that any profession does this exceptionally well, but if you wanna be a great salesperson, understand the impact to business overall solve you know hundred million dollar problems at a hundred dollar problems yeah and i'm hoping people take that to heart what you're talking about is is the difference between a sales professional and a sales amateur if we look at other industries and other careers that are actually called professionals is the amount of research the amount of study the amount of testing the amount of you know, uh, uh, requirements they have for an ongoing basis. Even if we look at trades like plumbing and general contractor and electricians, like those are professions because they're held to a standard and they had to put in some effort. Salespeople show up one day and all of a sudden you're in sales, may or may not even need to be licensed. Uh, and here you are expecting to get paid well uh, and may or may not be getting the results. And what you're saying is that basically they're amateurs because they're not putting in the effort to make themselves a professional, right? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. Without any certifications, there is no standard. So you have to set it for yourself. You have to drive yourself. You have to position yourself as someone who cares, who someone is going to get better when someone says, so why should I buy from you? The answer is because of you. Because if the answer isn't you, well, then you're a commodity. Then I don't need to buy from you. I could buy from anybody. But you need to be the difference because often you are the only difference. Let's be clear, right? We know that you're the difference. I mean, that's what well, LinkedIn helps surface great sales professionals. And it also shows us that most of them don't give a darn about who they are. It's very interesting. <laughs> yes, uh, for sure. Um, so you mentioned that at some level, it's a commodity, right? Except for some very rare, unique products or services out there. Most of it's a commodity where there's option A, option B, option C, and at some level, they're about the same. You're talking about the salespeople, sales professionals, what they've got to do to to help themselves be successful. What what do you see? Because you've been in this game for a really long time, right? In sales in various capacities. What What's different with consumers? B2B, B2C, doesn't matter. What are people looking for? What are people hoping to find when they're interacting with a company slash salesperson? Well, they're hoping for insight, not information. The internet has more information than ever before. We have more information available to us, but we don't really have any anyone to help us distill that down and to cut the wheat from the chaff, right? To figure out, okay, so this is important, Jason, you should listen to this, and the rest of this might be noise, not because I say it is, not because you say it is, but because of what you learn about the customer, what you know about the industry, what you know about the job, what you know about the company, what you've really researched, right? Because the problem is, again, if all I read is headlines, I think that surface level problem is enough. In reality, that's seldom enough, and I would say, you know, consumers also want to fix their immediate problem and they they're talking to you because they want to go fast, right? The only reason they're taking a, a, a sales call is because they want to go fast and they could go on their own, whatever it is that they're doing, right? So, so let, you know, plumbing, I could theoretically watch a YouTube video and replace my own toilet. Okay. That's true, but I'm not going to do it fast. It's not going to happen this weekend. It's probably not going to happen this month. It might not happen this quarter. Meanwhile, drip, drip. My toilet's going to fall through, but I got other things to do. I got a six year old who needs my attention here. I got my 15 year old who wants to learn how to drive here. I got my wife over here. I got my life over here. I got my work over here. I got extra stuff that I'm doing. But until that becomes a focal point, a priority, I don't do that. So. As a sales rep, as a sales professional, you need to help people prioritize that. Like, is this important now? And help them see that if it is important now, then let's go as fast as we can. Let me help you go faster. Let me help you not have to go to YouTube to learn how to change your own toilet. Let me not have you have to use eight pieces of software when one will suffice, right? So I think that's the big thing that consumers are looking for, they're looking for speed, they're looking for efficiency, and they're looking for help prioritizing this stuff. 
And that all comes with insight. And that's why salespeople have to be sales pros and not sales amateurs. I love it. When when you're doing trainings, the stuff that you're dealing with, and and this is this is kind of a curveball thrown at you. Any questions you get from salespeople in trainings or companies that are you're talking to, maybe they've even hired you, but questions or things they bring up where you're like, I can't believe you're asking that. How do you not get it by now or understand? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, sure. So, so one of the one of the big ones that I often get that I'm like, really, is the whole activity thing, right? That you have to do more because I'll tell you, I've talked with sales reps and sales managers who are like, well, I just trust that my people are going to do their best work. We well, have to trust, but verify. I got to see that you're doing your best work. I want to see that. I want to, you know, I want to take a sample, right? I mean, I'll tell you, right? I like bourbon. If I'm, if they, the, the, uh, the master distiller, if they never took a drink out of that barrel, I don't want that barrel. Yeah. Well, I, it's still bourbon, I guess, but not really. So I need to trust, but verify. I need someone who's an expert to look at that and say, yep, okay, I sampled enough to trust. Okay, let's go on to the next person. Let's go on to the next one. So that's one big one that I'm like, what? And then the other one is the whole, they don't really understand the power of social from even just a branding perspective. I'm not talking about reachability, but here's what happens, right? So. Uh, your sales reps are pushing here. They're pushing. They're calling, they're emailing, they're doing all this stuff, right? And they might even send them a LinkedIn message. They might uh, follow them. They might do all the right stuff, but then you go back to their profile and they look like crap. <laughs> and they're like, well, uh, if my salesperson, if their profiles look really good, they're, they're just gonna go get a job somewhere else. Well, if they look like crap and they stay with you and you scare off all your prospects, is that better? Yeah. So that's the other one that I hear. And, I, and again, then I would say probably the third one that I get is, how come nobody's ever told me this before? How come, whatever it is, right? So some of this stuff is because we assume that, that you know, sales is just innate, right? You got it or you don't, Yeah. but it's not. I mean, the conversation's innate, maybe. Maybe, I say maybe, because some people, maybe 10%, right? 10% of people are great conversationalists by birth, maybe, maybe 2%, really, right? But who knows? But I'm, I'm not gonna say nobody is skilled in that, but it, you have to practice and you need training and you need coaching and you need ongoing development. And some of that stuff needs to be in person or I guess live over Zoom now, right? Some of that stuff needs to be self-paced and some of that stuff needs to be with my manager. And sometimes a manager needs a second or third voice because sometimes just looking at it a little different and some of that's gotta be go read a book gang and go listen to something. I mean, so why is this all, why have I never heard this before? It's because your sales manager probably got promoted because they were the best sales rep, not because they're the best leader. If that happens, they maybe they grew up in easy times when there was no struggle for sales. That's very different than as Anthony and Areno talks about, right? Eating their lunch when you're in highly competitive blue ocean strategy, oh, that'd be great. Oh yeah, nothing's a commodity, bull crap. Just about everything is, right? Eat their lunch, you gotta go after your competition. You're in a commodity and you're the difference. That's why you never heard it before because it used to be easy. I mean, when the company started often getting to 30, 50 million, relatively easy in, in a software space. If you're first a plumber and you saw that there was a need for it in your town, you're the brand new person. Okay, a lot of people found you at first, right? Because you got a ton of referrals and then what? Yeah. Then what happens after those 17 referrals dry up? Now you got to sell. And nobody ever told you that if you're in the service industry, sales is probably the number one thing you got to do. Either you have to do it or somebody's got to do it for you. Otherwise, I mean, you can be a really good plumber, but if nobody's calling you, who cares? I think that's fascinating. I've never thought of that before what you're talking about like that like literally is is going off in my brain and, and seeing that in organizations i've been at and or work with now or just see from the outside or that's so true a manager was a good sales rep 
one of the few in the beginning where it was easy or the leads were dialed in or something was there, not much competition, not much regulation in the industry, whatever it was, it's more the wild west, right? Like the frontier land where it's like, you know, if you want it, it's easy to just figure it out. And then all of a sudden it gets difficult. And that person's trying to scale something they've never had to deal with, which is actual sales ability and systems and processes. Um, so fascinating to think about that evolution and it doesn't take much to get there either, right? Like it doesn't mean the company has to have been around forever. It's just how was that salesperson raised versus what are they trying to manage now? It could be two completely different games, right? And it, well, it usually is, right? It usually is different games, right? Well, you know, Marshall Goldsmith, right? What got you here won't get you there. So true. What got me to 5 million isn't going to get me to 50. Yeah. What got me to 10 isn't going to get me to 20. What got you to your first 100K, if you're starting out, isn't going to get you to your first million. You need those systems, right? It isn't just charisma anymore. This isn't accidental. You have to really be deliberate. You need systems. You need processes. You need thoughtfulness. That's where you need a professional. You don't just need to be winging it anymore. Because I'll tell you, when I started out, I, you know, I got a lot of referrals, right? All the folks that I worked with, we didn't, ha we didn't allow them to social sell. That was an easy hit. Yeah. Okay, great. Now I fished out of that pond. Now what? Yeah. Now what do I do, right? I mean, that's the question. Now, certainly I'm not telling you, you know, that referral selling isn't a great way to build your business, but then is there a referral system in place? Fantastic. Great. That can work too. That's part of sales. Okay, let's do that then. Then let's build that system out. And have a couple of systems. It's not just, you know, multiple streams of revenue means it's coming in multiple ways. So some come in from referrals, some might come in from, from partners. They're often similar, but not exactly. You might compensate one or the other or both. It's possible, right? And then what are you doing yourself? How are you generating your own stuff? Or did you hire a salesperson, right? But that's gonna take you some run. That's not magic either. I mean, nobody, nobody wakes up and says, okay, Jason, I just sold 10 units, hire me. Wouldn't that be nice? That's not how this works. Then you learn your product, learn your services, learn your culture, learn your systems. If you don't have any systems, then they're gonna build one. Eesh, right? That's tough. I mean, that's why they bring someone like you in, right? To help with that, to accelerate that, to make that go faster, as opposed to having to do that all by yourself. But I think a lot of business owners miss that piece. Yeah. They have systems for a lot of stuff, but they often don't have a sales system. No, rarely have a sales system from what I see and not one built for where they're going, maybe built for where they've been. Right. And it's interesting because you're talking about this where, you know, going the you know, 30 to 50 million is one thing, going to the next level in your own finances, making 100,000 to making a million. Like if you haven't done it before, you need some help, systems, coach, mentor, those kind of things. Um, you see that a bunch with small startup type organizations where there's the founder CEO, they have experience getting it to one level, but then that company needs to grow to a whole nother atmosphere, right? Like Galaxy. And a lot of times the company yeah. replaces that person who was the founder CEO because they, if they really want to go public and go big, they need somebody who's done it before. Um, and, you know, then egos get in the way. And I can see sales organizations thinking like the salesperson's done it. So they should be able to just manage you know, a hundred people doing the same thing. Like it doesn't matter, right? It's, it's easy. Just show up and close deals. Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? Huh? <laughs> That's not even close. That would be awesome, right? I wish I could do that, right? I'd go hire 10 salespeople to sell whatever today. That's not the case, right? Why we would need products. We would need, we would need systems. We wouldn't, you wouldn't need a CRM. You just hire people with great memories and they were Mensa, there right? That's it. That's it. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. <laughs> Cool. All right. We're done here, we're Jason. Done. We That's solved it. it. We finally solved what uh, it yes! takes to be successful in sales. <laughs> At extrovert, charisma, loaded, uh, photo, uh, photo memory people. Obviously not me. Yeah. I can't even think of words. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, same. On this topic, because we're spending most of this time talking about sales and not leadership and organizations and things like that, which is great. I love this. What's your take on scripts? Well, when you're starting out, you have to have a script. I think it's important, right? You have to have a script. You you need to practice something so you have something, right? I think that's super important. I used to be totally anti-script, and I'll, I'll just tell you, right, 10 years ago, five years ago even, I hated scripts. Now, 
you have to start from somewhere. If I don't know what to say, if I can't find words, is that any good? No! Have a script. So say the script, practice the script, get good at the script, and then infuse it with your heart, infuse it with your mind, infuse it with your personality. For sure, right? I mean, yeah, well, a scripts, I look at scripts as really outlines, as templates to start from, not as endpoints, right? So the exact words, yes, the first couple times, say the freaking words, right? The right syllables must pronounce the correct way. Uh, yeah, that's how this works, right? Initially, of course. I mean, you wouldn't say, well, you know what? Jason, I know you want me to sell your product or service, but you know what, man? I've never heard of it before, but here's how I'm gonna do it. You'd be like, what? Are you an idiot? Why would you do that? No, here you go. You would say, hey, Phil, I've sold this before, or I worked with someone, if you're brand new, right out of the womb in the business, I worked with someone and created a script. Let's start here and then single variant test, right? Let's test, start here. Single variant test till we get a great one. And then yeah, once you get really good, heck yeah, infuse your personality. Infuse some story. Infuse some other stuff, right? But use that as an outline, as a great starting point to help at least get some energy so you get some reps because otherwise you pick up the phone and it's like yabba dabba do. who's this? Hello? And they're like, uh, what? Why would I buy from you? Shut up, click, gone. Right, or maybe not click, they just press disconnect now. That that old click, right? So, yeah. I I, I think that's amazing. And I love that, you know, this, the script is where you start. I think this is important too, because this is where people get hung up. They think the script is the whole process and it's the whole guide and it's not. It's where you start. It's not the end point. It's not how you finish the conversation, right? It's how you're starting, it's how you're going forward. Um, and anybody who knows me knows that I'm pro script in the beginning as well, especially if it works. If the script works and you're fighting it and you think you're better than the script, you can try to prove it, but I promise there's going to be a box waiting for you and your stuff. Um, because you're, you're not. You can't just come in cold and, and think you know. And for anybody who is that amazing where they can come in and sell something without a script, you're probably on your own selling stuff anyway, right? Like, why are you going to go work somewhere else if you have that super ability? Yeah, that's absolutely right. You know, if you get that 1% of naturally gifted sales professionals that can just walk in cold, hey, God love you. But the rest of us, we're not that good. I'm not that good. Jason's not that good, right? But that's just not true. It's just not possible, gang. I mean, if you even, just even saying that out loud, sell, right? Sell me this pen. Good luck. Here's no script. Get out of here. That's not how this works. And for organizations, this is where it's really dangerous. The business owners and the leaders who think it's okay, I'll just find people who know what they're doing in sales. Like I don't need to give them a script because they're not gonna use it anyway. I don't need to give them a CRM, just let them do what they do best, air quotes. Um, and that's, uh, you're gonna hemorrhage a lot of a lot of money. It's gonna be a lot of painful turnover in your organization or a lot of bad sales yeah. that they're gonna make because they've literally just mm -hmm. made everything up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're going to get a lot of a lot of buyer's remorse because they might have inauthentic persuasion, right? They might be arm twisting manipulators instead of authentically persuading people to make a decision in their best interest. I love it. Great, great tie in with the show. Uh, that's that's awesome. And uh, I think this is a great place for us to stop, especially on that product placement uh, and, and that plug there. Um, so for people who want to find more about the amazing Phil, I know your website is Phil Gerby. G E R B Y dot com. They can find you if they look you up on LinkedIn uh, under uh, if they search Phil Gerbachak. Uh, they find you, see you with your glasses, all the stuff that you post on there. It's easy to identify you and see you in the feed all the time. Um, and, and I'm excited for us to continue this on part two. But for now, I appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing the stuff. Like, I'm this is fun. I, I do this all the time and I'm literally taking notes because there's some stuff that you said that are that are true gems and I appreciate you coming on here and uh, dropping all this knowledge. 
good times. Thanks, brother. Yeah, and hang on. We'll finish the... Well, let's go to a part two here in a moment. Um, and for everyone else tuning in, I appreciate you being part of my journey and this process of turning sales from a dirty word into something that the world trusts and respects and the kind of stuff that Phil and I do. So appreciate you taking time out, watching this, listening to this, and uh, helping us help you close more deals, make more money. Until next time, thanks for helping fill the world with authentic persuaders.